the aim today is to emphasize the analytical aspects of um, this subject. Not that we're going to actually do any analysis, but um, I hope to indicate where there are interesting anal analysis and PDE type questions uh, uh, arise and are in fact central to this topic. <coughs> And there will be two parts of the talk. The first will be the part that's still left over from the previous lectures, parts we haven't managed to fit in from the previous lectures. Uh, <coughs> so let's just dive right in and talk about that. <coughs> and the title of this part is Gluing. Not quite sure how to spell it. Uh, and the longer title is that gluing techniques, which we're going to explain what we mean by that, these have been the dominant technique in this subject, going back to the work of um, Dominic Joyce in uh, the mid-1990s. I, I have a... You mentioned Brian's on the first lecture. Right. Well, actually, I've. Yeah, I haven't. Maybe I should mention some names. I haven't really been trying to mention names, but that's, that's a good point. That's, so ev everything I've said up to now, essentially, well, more, with, with a, a few exceptions, would have been known to uh, Robert Bryant in around about 1990. Bryant's um, breakthrough result was to construct local examples of these metrics, and so more or less we've been we've been bringing you up to date. 1990 so far. And we've only got about, we've got to cover the 30 years in the next <laughs> hour. Uh, <clears throat> so I won't write, write down the name. We, we, we did mention some other, we mentioned Berger, Bryant, Hitchin, I've also mentioned as important ideas, and uh, Jim Simons, of course. Uh, and now we're mentioning uh, Joyce. So I'm saying that these, these techniques have been dominant in this subject. Uh, starting from the work of Joyce in 1990, uh, around 1996. I, I, have a, I have an idea, actually, this work was done while Dominic was in the Institute. But I, I sent him an email to check, but I haven't heard back. But let's, um, let's sort of make up the history and s s assert that <laughs> that's what happened. It's recorded, it's now official. It's recorded and now official. Official, yes, that's right. <laughs> anyway. So let me explain what we mean by these gluing techniques, and um, in particular, how they enter into the, what we're talking about here is the construction of compact examples of these uh, manifolds with G2 holonomy. But let's mostly explain this uh, through uh, an analogy. Uh, with the case of Kummer surfaces. So um, classically, this would be a particular kind of K3 surface, a particular way of constructing these complex K3 surfaces. But what we mean by it here is we want to uh, understand the Calabi metric on the K3 surface in terms of the following construction. Uh, first, we take a four torus, a flat four torus. Uh, think of it as. R4 over a lattice. Uh, and then we have a map. The, the map x goes to minus x on R4 induces a corresponding map uh, on the 4 torus. So we could take a quotient space, T4 over plus or minus 1, which is a, a flat orbifold. In other words, it has a, it has a flat metric, but there are 16 singular points corresponding to the points of order 2 in the 4 torus, uh, which, is, which are modeled on so a, a, a neighborhood of these is modeled on a neighborhood of 0 in R4 over plus or minus 1. <coughs> which is not what I'm saying. This is a, this is a cone 
over a RP3. So we want to this is this is a this is a singular object. We want to understand sort of the K3 manifold in terms of removing these singular points. And the, the other the main character that comes in here is what's called the Eguchi Hansen manifold, also I think found by Kalabi. So this is a, 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 a non-compact four manifold with a, um, a hyperkähler metric. So we need to write down, remember we said a hyperkähler metric could be characterized as a triple of closed two forms with satisfying this orthogonality condition. And we can write these down very explicitly. If we take, if we take uh, in many ways we could write this down. Let's take the product of the group SO3 with a uh, the positive real line with a parameter r in the real variable. So on, on SO3, we have a, um, a, triple of, a standard triple of left invariant right one forms, so epsilon i on SO3, uh, which satisfy d epsilon i is epsilon j wedge epsilon k, where i, j, k run over cyclic permutations of one, two, three. <coughs> then you can check that if on this four dimensional manifold we write omega one is d of r squared epsilon one, omega two is d of r squared epsilon two, and omega three is d of something different, the square root of one plus r to the fourth times epsilon three, then you can check, if I did the calculation right, that these three things will satisfy the identities required to, I mean, they're clearly closed forms because they're D of certain one forms, they'll satisfy the orthogonality condition. So this defines a hyperkähler structure. Uh, that, that metric is not complete. If we take the completion, then what we do is we add, we replace, we don't, we don't just add in a point at zero, we add in a whole two sphere. So the completion, so manifold, let's call it Q, is um, as a manifold, it's the cotangent bundle of the two sphere. <coughs> so the, the sort of schematic picture is that we have this non-compact manifold. It contains a, um, a two-sphere, which is an isometric, it's a round two-sphere, isometrically embedded. It's a non-compact manifold, but it's asymptotic to R4 over plus or minus one. In fact, if we, if we replace this with just R squared epsilon three, that would be the flat metric on, well, that would be the flat metric on this thing. So I'm, perhaps I should have recalled SO3 is diffeomorphic to RP3, recall. So when R is large, square root of 1 plus R to the fourth is approximately R squared. So that makes it plausible this thing is asymptotic to R4 over plus or minus 1. <clears throat> So that's precisely the same kind of behavior as we have at these 16 singular points. So the strategy is we take this, let's just draw not 16, but six, some, some number of these things. We have this, this is our T4 over plus or minus one. We're going to cut out uh, the singular point, and then we're going to take a scaled so this thing has got a fixed scale. Say so the area of this two sphere is some definite number. But we can scale the metric to make any number. So we can take a scaled version, say Q epsilon, where the area is epsilon, say. And then we're going to 
we're going to take this scaled down version of this thing. So that will contain, epsilon will be small. That will contain a very, very small two sphere. And then those will be approximately the same in an annular region, because they'll both look approximately like an annular region in R4 over plus or minus 1. And then we're going to, initially, we're just going to glue those together using a sort of a partition of unity type thing to. What metric? What metric? What? Are you going to glue them? Uh, well, it doesn't really mean we're. Let me not, I'm not going to. We're going to, we're going to, so here we have a triple of, we have a triple of two forms. Let's call it omega 1, omega 2, omega 3, coming from the flat structure. Uh, here we have a triple of two forms. In fact, if we, we think about it, we can, we can, we can define two forms. Let's call them, say, omega tilde i. We can make them, say, closed, if we do the, uh, and they will almost satisfy the orthogonality condition, but not exactly over this annular region, because we're going to take a sort of a partition of unity to. You know, not, and we're not going to write down the details. You get the idea of what we're going to do. <coughs> so we're going to do that 16 times. So in general, we would have 16 different scale parameters that we've got here. Why do you get them to be closed for? Why? When you glue, how do you manage? Well, you, so let's schematically, you're going to write, um, well, you're going to write omega i equals omega i plus d of something on this annular region, and then you're going to um, you're going to take d of chi times a, where chi is a cutoff function going from zero to one, and so you're going to mess things up a bit because of the derivatives of this chi. <coughs> so, the, the, uh, so this is kind of a, a paradigm of these gluing things. We construct an approximate solution, and then the problem, the, what we then do is deform that slightly to get a genuine solution of our kalabi yau problem. So we deform, what do we call them, the omega tilde i, to get a genuine solution. So, I mean, schematically, what's involved in here? Sch so schematically, let's, let's, let's just call this thing omega underlined or something. Schematically, we're going to change omega to omega plus, let's say, d of some, some data. A will have to satisfy, will have to satisfy an equation, which is going to be something like L of A plus N of A is equal to rho, where this thing is the linearization of our equation. This is some linear operator. This is some nonlinear part of our equations. And this is the, this is the gluing error. This is the, the, the damage we did when we did this cutoff function and glued it together. So we need to solve an equation like this. Um, we have a parameter epsilon around. Everything depends upon epsilon. The basic problems are that we want to be able to well, we have some norms, appropriate norms. We want to be able to invert the, um, the nonlinear, sorry, invert this linear operator and have good estimates on the, the norm of the inverse, um, uh, co good estimates on the, the norm of the inverse compared to the size of the gluing error. And also, we need the, our norms to be compatible with this nonlinear nonlinearity. <coughs> So this is a way of, um, even if we didn't know, even if we didn't know anything about complex geometry or Calabi-Yau, Yau's theorem, this would be another way of constructing hyperkalometrics on K3 surfaces by going through this building up from these simpler building blocks. Oh, so you obtain a K3 surface? I'm sorry? You obtain a K3, the result is a K3 surface? The result is that you can do this, yes. You can, you can for, for if all the epsilons are sufficiently small, you can solve this problem and construct a, <coughs> and construct a hyperkalometric. 
So as I say, you, you construct, really, we, we wrote down <coughs> the general Torelli theorem, we wrote down a description of the whole moduli space. What you're constructing here is rather explicitly a description of a small, small part of that in this region. <coughs> and in fact, you can see, uh, just going back to the question of why, when we were just describing the, this Torelli theorem, why we had to remove these, the W delta involving the minus two curves, uh, you can see that, oh, sort of the same sort of thing here, um, Precisely, the original, let's just say it this way, our original singular metric will correspond to the point where we're on the intersection of 16 of those W deltas. Because all of these, these, all of these spheres have got self-intersection minus 2, minus the Euler characteristic of the 2-sphere. So these, these things represent homology classes of the kind we were saying. And not, not to go in, not to... Not to leaving out much detail, what, what we're saying is the pro that these, if, you, if you approach one of these walls, W delta, what happens is the two-sphere gets shrunk down to a point generating a singularity, just as we're seeing sort of in this construction. <coughs> so this is all an analogue. I mean, we, we, this gives another proof, if you like, of the existence of some hyperkähler metrics on K3 surfaces. And there's a, a well-known sort of folklore thing one could do. <coughs> uh, Is it true that whenever a K3 surface acquires a quadratic singularity, near the singularity, it is its Yes, that's, that's right. There are, there are, well, unless you had a more complicated configuration, in which case you get another... ADE singularity, but those also have similar descriptions. Yeah, that's right. So now let's go to the real case, but I, I, I only sketch it because we want to get on. Uh, so Joyce's original construction, so in, in, in inspired, I suppose, by this idea, <coughs> is that we take, um, well, we take a seven torus, we take a certain action of a group of order eight, z two to the cubed, which I won't I won't take time to write down. But you write down a certain action uh, in the quotient space <coughs> has uh, sixteen singular three tori. So rather than just singular points, we get right, sixteen should be twelve. Um, uh, and so a neighbourhood of one of these is modelled on. T3 times what we saw before, R4 over plus or minus 1. And what we do well, locally is just the product of what we did here with the T3. We, we cut out a neighborhood of a 3 torus and glue in a product of T3 with this Iguchi Hansen manifold scaled to a very small size. <coughs> there we construct our approximate solution. And then we go through, or well, Joyce goes through, a, um, and sort of a gluing analysis of this kind involving, as we said, the linearization will essentially be a Laplace operator on, on forms, uh, and eventually prove that you, you can construct a manifold in this way. <coughs> okay. Um, well, uh, essentially, but because because the Hodge theory, the invertibility becomes topological, so yeah. more or less it's built it's built in. But um, yeah, and I'm, that's all all the dev level of detail I'm trying to attempt to get to for this lecture. But just to say um, a bit more of the geometry, we have these we see these parameters, these scale parameters, but there's also a sort of a rotation parameter that these um, <coughs> these manifolds, Gucci Hansen manifolds have isometries, and also RP3 has isometries. So we can glue this thing in in different ways. The way you do the way of you know, leaving aside the scale, the way you do that gluing, from my view, it's given by 
um, SO4 over U2. The isometries of RP3 is SO4. The isometries that extend to the Aguchi Hansen are U2, and so get is a two sphere. So you also, in addition to this um, scale parameter, you have a an S2 parameter as well. In fact, you can put those together into a, an, an R3 parameter, which is just given by looking at the integrals of these forms over the two sphere to get three small numbers. Uh, so, so in fact, let's say how that works. Let's count up the dimensions in this, in this torus case. So the parameters, you've got um, three parameters for each point, one scale and one of the sort of rotation parameter, plus uh, the tori, the space of tori, Riemannian tori, has got dimension um, a half, five, four times five, which is uh, 10, which is 58. So that's three times 19 plus one. So remember that, that agrees with our calculation of the dimension, well, our assertion about the dimension of the moduli space of K3s from the point of view of this Grassmannian. The one coming from the volume form. So similarly here, uh, we have the parameters, the, the, the local moduli parameters we have are 3 times 12. For each of these things, we've got three gluing parameters. And then the torus, in fact, for the particular action you write down, this works for any rectangular torus. So you have seven parameters describing the torus. So you get, in this case, you get 43. So the manifold you construct has got third Betty number 43. According to our general theory, the moduli space has got that dimension, and the geometric interpretation of the parameters is as, as given. And this is just one example. That there are, I mean, Joyce wrote down hundreds of similar examples with various interesting features. <laughs> Okay. Well, there's, there's basically one other kind of construction known of compact examples of these manifolds. And this, uh, this is due to uh, Alexei Kovalev. And also involves, it's also a, a, from the from analysis side, it's a gluing construction, but with different kinds of building blocks. And also, there's more formable geometry involved in these building blocks. So let me just spend five minutes talking about this. So we start with W1 and W2 are going to be a pair of Fano threefolds. I put far no inverted commas because, well, one thing I'm not assuming you know what that means exactly, uh, but also it's not, these could be something called semi Farno or half, almost, the, the various things that things are like Farno threefolds at least, but not, maybe not, you know, we can relax that condition. But when they're three dimensional compact complex algebraic varieties, they contain divisors, D1 and D2, which are in, so DI is in the linear system, the anti canonical linear system of WI. What this is saying is that there's a, a meromorphic um, three form on the thing with a pole along this thing. And that pole has a residue, say, which is a, that three form has a residue, uh, which, is, is it called, which, is a, which is a holomorphic two form on D, DI. And these things are K3 surfaces. So that, that's, that, that's what we suppose we have. Uh, and then the other thing we do is that we choose curves, CI and DI, and we blow up these curves. So we get another pair of manifolds, W tilde I, W tilde 1, W tilde 2. And these curves are chosen uh, at the appropriate the system so that if we take the proper transform of DI in this blow up, 
that thing has got trivial normal bundle. Um, well, so no, they're not uh, complex geometers will know what I mean, how, but let's not bother too much. You, you do some blow up operation and you arrive at a slightly different manifold. But it, it still contains a copy of this DI. So now. Sorry? The divers and the curves are non singular. Non singular, yes, yes. Uh, initial, yeah. Smooth, smooth K3 devices, yeah. So now the, the, the deep input in this construction is a version of Yao's theorem, which says that in this situation, um, there is a, a hyperkähler metric on the non compact manifold W tilde i minus di. So this is a no, this is a non-compact version of the standard Yao theorem. And in fact, it goes back to there's a, there's a theorem of Tian and Yao, and, and then refinements that give more precise description of the metric due to various other people. But let's not write down. Let's write dot dot dot. So the the, the conclusion is that there's a asymptotically cylindrical. Calabi R metric on uh, W tilde I minus DI. So it's, pictorially, this looks like something like this. So it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, so it's, it's non compact, complete. It's not exactly a cylinder, but approaches a cylinder at an exponential rate as we go down there. So this is, a, this is a deep fact. It's something you can't just write the metric down. You, it follows from a version of the general from complex mont ampere theory. So what we're going to do, or what Kovalev does, no, I say Kovalev and then follow again, the construction extended uh, by other people. Is that going to work? We'll take this thing. Let's know. So let's say this is W tilde 1 minus D1 and multiply by a circle. So now we've got a 7 manifold. This, is, this has got holonomy contained in G2, but in a rather trivial way because it just, it, we're just taking a product with this circle factor. So we're just considering SU3 sitting inside G2. <clears throat> so that's not very interesting. I mean, we're just sort of trivially going from six dimensions to seven dimensions. Uh, and then we do the same thing. I need to be a bit taller for this. But on the other side, let's draw it in here. We take W tilde 2 minus D2 times S1 on that side. <clears throat> so now the special thing is we're going to do that, and then we want to glue these things together on the cylindrical parts, but in a, in a slightly non-obvious way, in that in this cylindrical region, the cil we've, got, uh, D this, we've got D2 times S1 times S1 times R. This is a, this is a model for the cylinder. You see, we're taking the, the circle, and this circle originally is a little circle going around this divisor in the complex manifold. Whereas the other circle is the circle we just put in by hand, taking a product. And so similarly here, so d1 times s1 times s1 times r. And when we do the gluing, we interchange these two circles. We, have inter we interchange the trivial circle on one side with the non-trivial circle on the other side. So we don't, if we just do this, and initially just constructing a manifold, we don't get a circle action on the whole manifold. Where we do, we have uh, in the middle we have a torus action, the two torus, but different circles in that two torus extend over the different parts. <clears throat> so when you assuming you can do that, in a, in a, you have a, a super compatibility that we'll come back to, then you can follow the same kind of procedure. You have an approximate solution. You write down the error term. You deform it to a genuine solution. The same kind of fashion. What one has to understand then is what is the condition that you can do this matching up. 
So that one could completely analyze in terms of the K3 surfaces. The point is that this K3 surface, say D1, there, we have a triple of, we have, we have, its hyper, we have its metric form. I mean, this thing comes with a complex structure. We see a complex structure. And now tells us we have a Kähler metric. And how we also, we have, it comes with a, a holomorphic two form. And we can take the real and imaginary parts of that. And on the other side, similarly, for D2. When we do this matching up, the point is that we have to change, the, we have to match up the omega 1 here with, say, the real of theta 2 here. So we have something, something which is visible in algebraic geometry on this side has got to go something which is invisible in algebraic geometry on that side. We only understand it through the sort of theory. But since we have that theory, everything can be written down in terms of this period map and um, one can understand this in many examples. But, so. For example, I, I, don't, I we don't want to say any more because time is running out. E.g., for example, the simplest case would be to take W1 equals W2 is equal to CP3. So like D1 and D2 are both going to be surfaces of degree 4 in CP3. And they're, they're diffeomorphic. Uh, they're, all, they're all diffeomorphic, but we need to choose them so they're diffeomorphic in this way that takes the Kähler form, the, the, the real part of the holomorphic form. And, but one can do that. And so we end up with, um, in this case, you get a moduli space of dimension 155. If you can, but most of the, I mean the, you have to choose your K3 surfaces. Uh, you have to choose the, most of these parameters come from the choice of the curve you're going to blow up. What you, what you have to do is you take, once you've chosen one D1, the curve is given by the intersection of D1 with some other cortic. So that gives you many other parameters. <coughs> so this is just a, an outline, but again, there are, there are hundreds, well, in fact, with the extensions of later workers, uh, maybe even millions of examples of these G2 manifolds can be constructed in this way. Of singular uh, limit you were uh, previously uh, um, well, it, right. So there's a there's a the parameter the gluing parameter now is the length of the of the neck. Yeah, I didn't I didn't really say that. So you can ask about if you let that length go to infinity. What is the limit of that? Um, it depends a bit how. A bit, so you could normalize. Ultimately, you could say we're going to normalize our manifolds to have diameter 1, and then we're going to take a gromov hausdorff limit. So then the gromov hausdorff limit would just be an interval. And that, that would be where I was saying it. So it's not, that's why I say there, are, there is some, yeah, there, there is no established moduli theory which should give us kind of a standard answer to the question of making a compactified moduli space or something. But certainly, this is, a, this is another typical kind of behavior that can occur, a way you can get another typical kind of way in which you can get failure of convergence for sequence of these metrics. One is developing these cone-like singularities, and the other is splitting into two pieces. And we could also have written, written down analogs for K3 surfaces of this behavior, in which you have like a K3 surface splitting up into a pair of rational surfaces, and things of that kind. Right, but that's all we have time for um, in this part of the talk. <clears throat> I should say, this, so this, this, this has been the dominant technique in the subject, not just for constructing the, um, the manifolds themselves. Uh, we said we had all these interesting geometric objects, these special submanifolds, and these Yang Mills connections and things. Uh, there are also many examples of these that have been constructed, but in the same kind of spirit, by taking some model which you understand better with some simpler geometry, gluing them together, and showing that you could deform to a genuine solution. And of course, these kind of gluing techniques have been used in 
all kinds of other areas in differential geometry, such as in, for example, in Taubes' work on Yang Mills' theory many years ago, uh, and other work on constant mean curvature surfaces, and so forth. The same general idea. <coughs> But that's enough of that. Part two is to talk about beyond gluing. Question, well, uh, so can we do some other kind? Can we do something about proving the existence solutions, which is not sort of making small deformations or something simpler? So I put question mark because uh, I'm going to indicate some directions that one could follow, but I don't actually have any uh, there's no uh, big results, say, in this direction. But let, let me kind of indicate some things that one can do. And I have the time. I've got 25 minutes. So, so we're going to have three oh, let's see. There are, whether we're going to get to them, three related things that one can say. One is to discuss boundary value problems. Another is to discuss dimension reduction. And a third is to discuss what are called adiabatic limits or collapsing limits. So, and, and as you'll try, try to show, all of these topics are sort of related. Uh, so let me, in the last 20 minutes, try to say something about these things. So let's, okay. so let's now, so now we're going to have a, an oriented manifold, uh, but now a compact manifold with boundary. <coughs> so what we want to say is that we, supposing we're given a three-form row, which is um, what we call definite. If we go back to the, the first lecture, we explained this is open set of th special three forms, or open set of three forms in six dimensions. So definite at each point and uh, close, d rho equals zero. So this is, this is data on the boundary. And we ask, can we find so g2 structure phi on M with phi restricted to the boundary of M is equal to rho. So, so actually, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to go through this, but to, to get the best setup, we should fix some cohomological data. But let's ignore that. <coughs> so this is a, this is a this is what I want to discuss. The point is that this is an elliptic boundary value problem. So that um, many features of the discussion we had in our second lecture about the general deformation theory and so forth on a closed seven manifold work again here. And up to some possible issue of five-dimensional obstruction spaces, uh, if, you, if you have a solution and then you say you deform rho a little bit, you know that you can deform the phi a little bit up to some, it's a kind of a, a nominal Fredholm problem, so up to possible five-dimensional obstructions which you can expect to have some geometric interpretation. <coughs> uh, well, I'm not, yeah, to, have a, to have any time to say anything about these, that's all I'm going <laughs> to say about this. The, why, why should you do this? The point is that before, we had these big manifolds with Betty number 43 or something, 100 or something. It's quite, if we want to say, can we really understand the solutions of this PDE, it's difficult to even write down the manifold, let alone start. <laughs> start. So the point is here, we can ask interesting PDE analysis questions, even for very simple 
manifolds. We could start with, e.g., our manifold could be the seven ball, six. We can take the standard structure on the six sphere, which corresponds to the, the famous almost complex structure on the six sphere. That bounds the flat metric on B7. We can ask, if we start deforming this structure, can we deform this structure on B7 among G2 metrics? Can we deform it a little way, or can we deform it a long way? Or can we in some, make some hypotheses on the boundary data? Can we? So we have a, an interesting analysis problem without having to tangle with complicated topology. Let's, um, that's done A. <coughs> Well, no, I don't know. I mean, that's, that's a problem. For home. It's a homework problem. For, right, but I, mean, it's not, it's, I hope you, it's clearly an interesting analysis right. problem, which ob obviously one is probably too hard in itself, but there are a lot. Well, OK, so now let's talk about um, B. So in part B, we're going to talk about dimension reduction. Working in seven dimensions is perhaps um, off-putting. Can we get down to a, a lower dimensional problem by the well-known device of imposing some symmetry? So let's recall our formula, our, 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 our model for one model that we had for a three form is sum of minus omega i dx i plus dx1, dx2, dx3. So we're going to have two versions of this. Let's say B1. In B1, we're going to take our manifold to be uh, a three manifold, say V3 times a four torus. But actually, this, then they could think this is just the, 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 the three ball, if you like. We're going to be initially a local discussion, topologically a three ball. Uh, let's put also a, a function here. And the interpretation is that the omega i are going to be constant coefficient two forms on the four torus. So they don't depend upon the, they only depend upon the, the v3 direction. x1, x2, x3 are going to be local coordinates on v3. So omega i. So what we have, we can look at we can look at the span of omega i, a three-dimensional subspace uh, in uh, well, in the space of constant coefficient forms, if we like. But we can think of that also as the cohomology in H two of T four, which is now is R three three with this natural intersection form. We get this thing, rather, as opposed to the K3 case, we had R319. <coughs> so we get a map from V maps to, um, well, so this, this is going to span a three dimensional positive subspace in here, rather as we said before. So to the Grassmannian, the positive three dimensional subspaces of R33. Let's call it, say, what are we calling it? Say gamma. <coughs> so th this is just a w a writing down what it means to give a form of this particular kind. But now we can say, when, wh when does such a thing solve our G2 equations? Yep. What, what can we describe the gammas, if any, which give a solution of our G2 equations? And that is done by work of a David Braglia. Uh, in his student of Nigel Hitchin a few years ago. It says that, um, say, phi solves the G2 equation if and only if gamma is the Gauss map of a maximal like space-like submanifold. So what do I mean by that? I mean that we should have some map, say, H 
from V to R33, which is going to be a, an embedding, or maybe later an immersion or something. Um, the image is going to be a three-dimensional submanifold. It's space-like. That just means that the tangent space is a positive subspace with respect to this form. And it's maximal in the same sense as we talk about minimal submanifolds in Euclidean space. It's a, it's a, a critical point for s variations with respect to the area function. So just the, the, the natural analog of minimal geometry in indefinite spaces. So that's the theorem. So, so solving in this reduction, solving our G2 equations is just solving this maximal submanifold equation. And the proof is not, I mean, I, we don't have time to do it. It's not a very difficult calculation, really. And in fact, related, you can almost see this without calculation from the point of view of Hitchin's volume functional. The, the, the volume functional for such metrics essentially reproduces the volume functional of these submanifolds. <coughs> okay, so now we can combine that with our previous boundary value problem. Uh, and that comes the platform. What are we saying? Well, let's just say the same word. Supposing we're given, well, so we, in general, we could do this in general. Supposing we have RPQ, Lorentzian sp I mean, base of that signature. We take a submanifold sigma p minus 1, a p minus 1 dimensional space like submanifold in that sense. Uh, we ask, is that the boundary of some p dimensional space like submanifold which solves this maximal equation? That's called a plateau problem in this indefinite sense. Um, so this corresponds to the boundary value problem for G2 structures, or of, of this such G2 structures. Whereas if we take our boundary value descript set up, we look at a, cor a corresponding subset of the forms on the boundary in this setup, invariant under the form, the reduction just becomes this plateau problem. And this is, a, this is an interesting problem, a, a, a little explored area, I think, in geometric analysis solving these plateau problems. In the case uh, Q equals 1 is a, an old result of Bartnick and Leon Simon, which says it's more or less you can always solve this plateau problem. But there's not much work in the um, higher co-dimension case. But I'd be, I'd be quite optimistic that there is a general existence theorem um, in, in this context. Of course, you need to, you need to assume that your sigma p minus 1 bounds some space-like submanifold, mm -hmm. leaving aside the equation. And that just corresponds to saying you need to assume that your boundary value extends to some closed positive form, the sort of weaker notion, without imposing the, the extra condition that we discussed. Yes. You, you could, uh, yeah, oh, right. The, the, this makes sense for any P and Q. Yeah. Here, here in, in our applications, in our applications, our applications for some reason, P is three. Um, yeah. The general, the, the the natural general context is the plateau problem in indefinite. Yeah. Then it's uh, we, we so we. <laughs> This, we get a motivation for studying this little explored problem, I suppose, <laughs> from this uh, G2 uh, theory. OK, that's all we'll say about that. OK, so we're getting on. OK, that was B1. Uh, B2, we're going to use more or less the same formula. Oh, I'll never explain what chi was. R removing the, the chi, but with the opposite interpretation. now we'll have an action of a three torus. The x1, x2, and x3 will be coordinates in the three torus direction. <laughs> so I call this B2. The previous 
The previous thing is equivalent to equal equivariance by this four. Yes, essentially, essentially, you, yeah, essentially, we're looking at. Um, so again, we're going to write down the same formula. Phi is minus the sum of omega i dxi plus dx1 dx2 dx3. But now this is on uh, the product of a four manifold Q with a three torus, and our x1, x2, and x3 are standard coordinates on our three torus. Uh, but now the omega i are two forms on Q. So we've got a problem now in four dimensions involving a triple of two forms. What do our equations become? Well, first, we want uh, th these things to be closed. Um, we, also, we also need to suppose that these span a, a, a positive subspace at each point in the space of forms. Well, that's not that's an open condition. Uh, then we can introduce a dual. So the natural, if we have such a thing, we have a, a natural volume form, which I write as det omega i, which omega j is natural volume form. So what I mean by this is, if we choose an arbitrary volume form, and I can take the wedge part of these forms, divide that by the volume form to give me a number, I can take this determinant of that matrix with a third power and multiply by my reference volume form to give me a volume form. But from the fact that we had a third here and the way things work, that doesn't depend upon what volume form we choose. So this is an invariant volume form we can write from this triple of forms. So now there's a dual. I mean, we can write down that there's a, a dual f triple of two forms such that say omega tilde i such that omega tilde i wedge omega j is delta i j times this volume form. No. Basic. So in, in the span of so these omega tilde i span the same three-dimensional subspace as the omegas, is a unique solution of this yeah. equation. So oh, that's right, omega. Yeah. So that's the kind of the dual frame, in a sense, with respect to this thing. Uh, and the other condition is that the d omega tilde i is equal. So this, this is our, this four-dimensional reduction of our G2 problem. We have to find a triple of two forms which are closed, that's, not, that's easy, I, mean, I completely understand that. Well, then the problem is we have to do this complicated nonlinear operation to get another triple of two forms, and those should be closed as well. That's the kind of thing. <clears throat> but let's not stop there. That's, that problem still looks a bit difficult. Let's, um, well, let's make the things. Let's try making things simpler. Let's suppose an additional, have an additional S1 action on Q. So we're supposing we have an S1 action on our four manifold. Everything's invariant under that action. So then we can do something which generalizes what the people who know about these things will know what's called the, the Gibbons Hawking construction in the hyperkähler case. So so the hyperkähler case is just when the omega i are equal to the omega tilde i. Uh, anyway, so if you don't, if that's only helpful if you know. So we get what you get. We, this is elementary, but it would take ten minutes that we don't have or so to go through the construction. Is we we get the the, the, the we get a, the problem reduces to the following. We have some domain. Let's say u, let's say omega in R3. And the problem can be expressed in terms of a function, a, a convex function u, and another function v, 
on omega, satisfying the following two equations. One, the Monge Ampere equation. Take the Hessian of u, take its determinant, which would be 1. It's a familiar, familiar nonlinear PDE. And secondly, the v, uh, in, fact, in fact, the linearization of this equation. So the sum of um, So, so the uij is just the Hessian. U upper ij is the inverse matrix in the usual way. Uh, so we can write down this linear equation for v determined by the, the fact that u is convex as this is an elliptic equation. Um, Okay. So I haven't, I haven't explained why you get that, but it's, this is just some elementary differential geometry of writing your omegas in terms of, you know, with the circle action. R3 appears because you have, well, the analog, what you call a hypercalar moment map. You have, for each, if you think of each omega as a symplectic form, you have a Hamiltonian mapping to R. You put those together, you get into map into R3, and the image of that is just this omega. So that's what, what you get. So let's just, um, yeah, so part C, we won't get to that, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but let me just tell you, and I, and so let me just tell you what, uh, okay, I won't have time to explain at, at all the detail, but what, what, is the, what, is the, what does the boundary value problem become? in this context. So it becomes something um, sort of interesting. <coughs> it turns out it can be expressed in terms of a certain current or, or distribution supported on the boundary of omega. So uh, not to think a bit imprecise, but let's suppose that omega now is a, a smooth a domain in R3 with a smooth boundary, well, the boundary data. Okay, supposing in our original problem we had a, a boundary and so forth. This becomes a current or distribution supported on, on the boundary of omega of the, of the form, um, so L of f is uh, the integral of the boundary of omega of some form times uh, the normal derivative plus some other form times nu. For some, so more or less this is just a, <coughs> a delta function plus a delta prime function along omega. You, you're allowed to differentiate in the normal direction and, and with some arbitrary functions here. Wait, so they're, they're not quite arbitrary. This has got to be positive. <coughs> so um, it turns out that the, the solving this equation with the, and also solving our original boundary value problem can be expressed in terms of a, a dual variational problem. Very simply. So we, we minimize L of U restricted to the boundary of omega among all solutions of the Monge Ampere equation, det u e i a j equals 1 on omega. So we, we look at all solutions of the Monge Ampere equation on omega, which extend initially smoothly to the boundary. And for those things, we can compute this current. I mean, this, it only depends upon the normal derivative of things. Uh, and then we seek. To minimize among all these solutions in the Monge Ampere equation, we minimize that linear functional. And 
achieving that. We're not saying we can do that, but if we can do that, if and only if we can solve our other problem. So this is dual in the sense this becomes, the other problem becomes maximizing something, and this is the sort of dual thing which involves minimizing something. Anyway, this has, this has got the advantage again. This is something we could do it. There's no particular reason to do this in R3. The natural context would be Rn or more general things. Uh, this is an interesting kind of, as far as I know, new, weird, strange problem in analysis, but it seems a natural kind of thing. One can, understand, one can think about it without needing to know about G2 and all this kind of background and differential geometry. It's interesting. A misprint? No. Is a derivative of f and any evaluation of f is b? Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, that should be f. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, thank you. Yes, no, that's important to get this. No, I, want, I, want to, this is, I want everyone to understand this. To yes. Right yeah, everyone, sh everyone should understand this because you, know, you only need calculus to understand this problem. <laughs> okay, so, that's, um, so that's an example of the sort of interesting analytical problems which naturally arise in this study. Oh. Okay, so thank you for attending. Yeah.